See, when you talk about highways, uh, traditionally we think about the uh, roadway, the, the facilities we have, we think about uh, uh, people who, who use the system, and the vehicles, trucks and automobiles. And uh, vehicles have changed or changing drastically. Technology has taken over. And uh, people are people who change a little bit, you know, but not that as much. And uh, infrastructure uh, needs to be, we were interested in the infrastructure, that the facilities, and we will have to adapt ourselves to the changing technology, vehicle technology, and also people's expectations. Okay, with that, let me uh, uh, start with my prepared presentation. Now, I already mentioned that it's a system of systems. We're all interconnected. And if we go more than a high level of infrastructure or sectors, all of these things, energy, uh, well, this is the infrastructure that I mentioned in a city. But if I go higher that level than that, economy is another uh, sector we interact with uh, economy and larger aspects of uh, system and within transportation or within infrastructure comes all these items maybe more then within transportation we have transit non-motorized roads uh, all these things are individual systems and they all interact so today in from my presentation if you don't remember anything but I hope you remember I mentioned is a system of systems so in the roads, in the highways, we have our own systems of doing things, facilities and, and, and uh, elements we have. So does uh, transit and other. Then we interact. If something happens in one sector, for example, uh, let's, say, let's say energy sector, something happened. Uh, there was a blackout some years ago in the Northeast. And that affected everything, or everything that we can think of, finance, financial sector because uh, all the computers are down and uh, uh, you cannot uh, uh, go to the ATM machine get money or do the banking operations. Uh, you cannot go to the gas pump and, and pump get gasoline because the pumps are not working because of the electricity. So if you think about the connections, all, all the systems are connected and we must have that kind of vision and that vision really extends from what we had that uh, at the conclusion of the Toronto conference, I forget what year it was that, uh, 1980s, that uh, we, we thought payment, just owing about payment is not enough. We should think about the integrated total system. And then now we should think about uh, more than that, the transportation as it relates to other aspects of infrastructure and even higher than that uh, how it relates to economy and, uh, and the society as a whole. So within our uh, transportation, at least in urban areas, these are all sub-elements. Roads, transit, non-motorized, they have their individual subsystems or facilities or elements and they all interact too. If something happens uh, to the pedestrian facilities, that can affect the roads and transit. There will be more people who will perhaps will be in transit if the pedestrian facilities and, and the bikeways are taken out or done something to it. Or parking. Parking has a tremendous effect in all aspects of transportation. We don't pay much attention to parking. We don't think about it. And that's also connected to the, uh, where does the money come from? Where does the money go? And uh, we'll see with the uh, uh, autonomous vehicles, parking has a big thing to do. You know, we'll, we'll talk about that. So, uh, when you come to any kind of facilities and elements of infrastructure, assets, physical infrastructure, it has a life of its own. And we, uh, I did, uh, this is uh, Professor Lavi, uh, he came up with this idea. So it's his uh, credit to him. So uh, this is, you know, we come up with uh, uh, also oftentimes we think infrastructure is something uh, 
uh, infrastructure management or systems is planning, or some people think it's construction. Uh, we have a faculty member from construction. Thanks for coming. Yes, uh, construction is a big part, you know, contracts and all the scheduling, etc. But it's not all. They're all is construction or planning, not by itself. They're all connected. So we start with the planning, the larger system-wide planning. Then we do individual uh, facility planning. Then we do the design. Then, then of course, come construction. Each of these phases takes a certain amount of time. And uh, it, it's not like in China, in a, or I, you know, in a, in a, lockdown, in a positive sense. China, when they decide to do something, they do something. It is both positive and negative because oftentimes you don't do research or figure out the pros and cons. You can make mistakes, uh, but at least they don't diddle down. You know, they just go ahead and do it. But in a democratic society like the United States, we take a long time. Facilities from conception to construction can be as many as 20 years or 30 years. So. You know, all very deliberative process and also everything tied to financing, where does the money come from. So we do construction and then after construction, operation. And uh, operation, of course, it goes on forever perhaps, but the 20 years or so we take the life. And then we continuously monitor performance, inspect, and then time comes for preservation. Then at some point, at the end of life, uh, demolition uh, or disposal uh, or redoing new life uh, and, and, and then goes on. So this cycle may be 40 years, 40 to 70 years, but oftentimes it's in perpetuity. Very rarely we abandon facilities. There are some uh, bridges that were built 500 years ago. They're still not in this country, uh, uh, but uh, in, in many parts of the world. They're still in operation. They may be functionally obsolete, uh, but uh, they are still there physically. So that's the life cycle. So if you understand, it's one level of the different facilities and modes, and then within that, different activities that we do in the infrastructure, they're all connected. How we plan affects the design, how we design affects construction, and all throughout, they're all connected. So it's a system of systems. And this way, horizontally and vertically, system of systems. They're all connected. So uh, this you already know, but I just want to make sure we all understand. What, bottom line is, we want this uh, management system we have, it's a approach, strategic and systematic process, monitoring, operating, maintaining, upgrading, and expanding physical assets. Oftentimes we think our job is just uh, infrastructure management means maintenance or rehabilitation. But it's also upgrading and expanding that uh, if we need new lanes, new roads, they're all, as, all connected. Physical assets effectively for the life cycle. So this is what we do. So basically that's what the transportation agencies are supposed to do. If you go, all of the, uh, the culture is changing, but uh, I've been associated with this in this business for 50 years. It may, not, it, 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 it may seem a long time to you, but to me, it seems like just it went away like that. I started teaching in 1968, and uh, this is uh, 2017. And uh, I remember working, I started in Wisconsin. I started, and, and I remember working with the Wisconsin DOT, then I, of course, I worked with, uh, before that, I worked with Connecticut DOT, and then in Indiana DOT. The Department of Transportation, they always felt that their job is to maintain, preserve, and keep the roads, uh, highway, bridges in a tip-top shape. To them, if nobody uses, that's better because then things will not fall apart. But then it defeats the purpose. Uh, now this culture is changing, but that's the way it was. I always felt that the agencies, they would like to see that their, their facilities are in a good shape, good level of maintenance, 
So to them, if the less trucks, better it is. But then it doesn't serve the purpose, serve the economy. So we'll have to think about that. Our job is not to maintain and upgrade, but maintain, upgrade, expand all this to keep the facilities that can accommodate the traffic that supports the economy and the society. The, unless we connect to the demand, then we don't serve the purpose. So it's not just the supply side, the demand and supply. Okay, so why we have to do asset management is because first most important is fiscal constraints. If you had unlimited amount of money, then perhaps we didn't need to worry about. Even then, you know, we worry about uh, because uh, what you set the priorities. Even if you have money, uh, you have to set priorities. Which one I should take care? That uh, how, how you know three hours. Well, not really three hours because there are unlimited amount of money. You don't have to optimize anything. It's all the money is there. We just need it, do it. But it may not be effective because you won't serve the uh, the demand as appropriately as you can do if you look into a systematic manner. But if you have lots of money, you don't have to worry about that much. So our purpose is efficient resource equalization, time demand. And now uncertainty management is becoming more and more important with the uh, global warming and the weather and the extreme weather and uh, those kind of events uh, <coughs> that uh, we cannot plan, we cannot, we cannot imagine things that we did not imagine in the past that things are happening. Uh, 100 year floods every year. Know, things of that nature. So there is some tremendous amount of uncertainty. Well, actually, what I said, <coughs> perhaps not right. If I know the 100 year flood will take place every year, I'll be, it's certain, I'll be prepared. But uh, not like every year, but every, so often. So uncertainty, not only the outside world environment, but also uncertainty about money, uncertainty about technology uncertainty about our computational procedures, etc. There's a lot of uncertainty. Again, this is a new awakening, new thinking that we must incorporate risk and uncertainty in our decisions. And then this is come next one is the more political accountability that uh, in a democratic process, <clears throat> what do we do? Our money's worth that we're taking from taxpayers, we must justify how we work. And overall, overarching issue is the sustainability. But what do we do? It's not sustainability, just the environment, but also fiscal sustainability. Whatever we do today, we'll be, uh, we'll be able to uh, keep it up and maintain in the future. And this is particularly important. Now, I used to do a lot of work for the World Bank in the past, for many, many years. And this is a very important item. It's, uh, uh, again, not just environment. We used to build things, or we still, World Bank still build things in the uh, developing world. But we consider that if we build, will, it, will, will the country be able to uh, maintain, and will it be sustainable? Not so much as environment, which is important, but also fiscal sustainability. So we, we, we think about not just today, but also in the future. So. The tools we have, traditional tools, which are changing, which are changing very fast. Now, our objective is the cost-effective asset management, that the black portion right there. But then, most important, or one of the important elements of the students and faculty and the researchers is the monitoring, monitoring, uh, proper monitoring and measuring conditions, usage, usage not only traffic volume, but also Low traffic load and appropriately taking that and and, uh, uh, and then other phases it will come. Then that brings to us to the database, database of different kinds of data that come from different areas. This is vastly expanding, and technology has provided problems or also opportunities. Problems, the difficulties of doing things, challenges, I must say. And we'll talk about a little bit more. And hopefully, 
Uh, by the way, I'm hoping that you will ask questions. And I don't know how much time we have, uh, but that, that's why the, the, I, I really enjoy if we ask questions. And then next part is the performance assessment and modeling. That's another area of research that we spend a lot of time and effort to develop proper performance models and not only to <coughs> describe the way system works right now, but also how it will perform in the future, uh, the, the probabilistic models in the future. Then we identify what kind of treatments will be appropriate uh, depending on the demand and the conditions and how, what you predict will happen. We always do things in the future, a few years ahead. So keep that in mind. Then we do trade-off, and that is becoming more and more important. If I have <coughs> some money, should I spend that money on bike packs or should I add another lane, traffic lane? And this, uh, to some of you, may not make much sense. But uh, those of you who are from developing countries, and I myself, I, I have worked in developing countries, I've, fit, I've seen the so many myopic, short-sighted decisions made to expand carriageways for automobiles or automotive units at the expense of pedestrians and bicyclists or non-motorized traffic. They have, in, it, it just, no, everywhere, the same thing. In Europe, if you have gone to Europe, I don't expect you to. 40, 50 years ago, there used to be very wide sidewalks, and they started to take sidewalks out and expand the, uh, the roads and streets for uh, automobiles. Now, in Europe, there may be some higher, higher ownership and use of automobile, but not in, in uh, many developing countries like India. And uh, very few people use, comparatively speaking, auto ownership is very low. Even auto use is very low. So if you have limited amount of money you won't spend on, on uh, highways and streets, you should do something to increase your throughput, number of people, person miles, uh, the vacant miles. But uh, uh, I remember many, many years ago in India, in my part of India, I came from Calcutta. And the uh, uh, first time I went back, I, they were building a river crossing. Uh, uh, they have a, uh, two cities and crossing. And uh, 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 I said that uh, one of the bridges, you should leave it for pedestrians and non-motorized traffic, like the bicycles and rickshaws and other, and transit maybe, and use other one for, for, for uh, trucks and buses. They thought I was absolutely weird. <laughs> so they're building this so much traffic, uh, and and even to, because it, it, I don't know, you, you can imagine their people don't have income, and they walk. I wanted them to develop a integrated pedestrian facilities. Same thing for you know I worked in uh, in Bangladesh, and Nepal, those countries. You know. Bangladesh, I know one person is from Bangladesh here, she can uh, confirm. There are a lot of rickshaws, the pedicabs, and uh, uh, lots of people, they non motorized traffic, that's a lot. Of, and uh, they should provide facilities for those and keep the automobiles and buses, trucks, and trucks separated. Uh, but it's difficult, it doesn't happen. But anyway, so there is a trade-off, tremendous amount of trade-off. And you know, whenever we talk about trade-off, then the issue comes, optimize. What are we are trying to optimize? So then come the program uh, optimization, as I mentioned, then the cycle goes on. And so these are some of the ways we do condition assessments, predictions, I said, that uh, the, from the data we collect for the BJs and pavements, and I'm sure a lot of you are doing more improved uh, uh, versions of these kind of models. And that's a big part of our research. Now this is uh, integrating the all kinds of data that we were getting for different kinds of facilities in an integrated manner. And there's a lot of research areas in this. 
and then this is all how we bring together and we optimize from payment, pages, safety, mobility, other aspects. Individually, we, we analyze and combine them for uh, 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 optimize uh, the overall utility of the facilities. And uh, these are the solutions that we do, the way we look at. I saw some of the papers in Pareto Optimality you have today, and these some of the things we always try to improve. Uh, and this is the three-dimensional trade-off analysis for bridge and pavement and safety. And now comes the emerging future. Things are changing very fast. The challenge is these connected vehicles and, and autonomous vehicles, you'll have to rethink your infrastructure. You know, like uh, we did not, we paid attention to the age lines. Age lines would be very important because the autonomous vehicle, you know, will be compromised, the camera would be looking to the age line. So their reflectivity and uh, they, have, they have to worry about those things uh, much more than we do today. And I already mentioned system of systems connected to Internet of Things, lots of data, huge amount of data, unconnected, and uh, it's like a drinking from a hose. Lots of water coming and you, you cannot breathe. You have to make sense, you have to mine and interpret. And of course the climate change I mentioned, risk and uncertainty and resilience and sustainability and funding and accountability comes as scrutiny of stewardship. And some of the uh, 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 places in the, in the world, they're talking about smart cities. Smart cities are really infrastructure management. The, the not only roads, other facilities too, water, wastewater, etc. There are opportunities for us researchers. There are advanced analytical tools you can develop. Data visualization which you could not do, now you can use uh, data visualization tool to look into what kind of alternative future you are looking at. And also, it has expanded our knowledge base, uh, other disciplines. We have used operation research, finance, economy, statistics, computer science, psychology. All of these things are coming to, together in infrastructure management system, not just civil engineering. And the big data, there are opportunities I mentioned, and uh, uh, there a lot of work can be done, and a uh, lot of work already being done. And asset monitoring, there uh, we are using technology, uh, like take for example I-35 bridge in Minneapolis. They have started to put some sensors. So all these sensors, huge number of sensors sending data. Massive amount of data. You, it's the only one I-35 B. A, a state may have 6,000 to 10,000 bridges. All the data coming, you have to have a, able to manage and interpret and make sense. And same way, not only asset, physical assets, but also operational mobility that uh, 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 we sense and monitor. And uh, real-time traffic data coming from all over and uh, you have to process, mine the data, process the data, combine that with other kinds of data that are coming from Uber, Lyft, taxi cabs, and uh, then every 10, 15 minutes you can revise uh, your, uh, or you can make decisions. Safety is a, you know, autonomous vehicle is coming. The main motivation for autonomous vehicle is safety. Okay, like the birds fly, the whole flocks of birds are coming. They, they, have you seen that they, they don't hit each other? The birds are dropping, hitting each other. They manage to get a, get around. Automobiles may not happen like that. That's the idea. That how we can make the zero death, and that's the autonomous thinking. Zero death. We have 1.5 million people die in the world today. Uh, 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 6.4 million crashes annually that in the United States, and uh, uh, I don't know exactly how many crashes, but more than a million people die in the world, and many more they get maimed and uh, uh, 
the, 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 they have they are seriously injured. And that can be only resolved by something like, as I said, the burdens. If we can come up with it. That's the whole in the vision for autonomous vehicles. Well, there are a lot of other things. I, I will skip if you have questions, you can talk about. I was involved in short two. Uh, 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 there is first time in the history of our transportation world, naturalistic driving study, and that provides a tremendous amount of data, massive amount of data we collected without knowing exactly how we're going to use them, but it's available to uh, look at people's behavior near crash or during crash. Energy and environment can also be monitored and measured uh, in a real-time basis. Okay, that comes the smart city, that, uh, which I said it is uh, really a part of the, the, our infrastructure management. And smart city where the physical meets digital. Now this I took from CH2M Hill, a presentation. And uh, the, if you look at the data, data collection, integration, then combining real time and historical data, and the, the light green part is a modeling part and the visualization. A light green part is our, our research, uh, the big part of our research. So exploiting big data, the challenges, there are a whole bunch of challenges. There are lots of issues still involved, the privacy, storage capacity, computational abilities, but that's, that's, a, that's a part of research. And I already mentioned about emerging threats. Uh, it not just uh, uh, preparing ourselves, the contingency planning, but also how we uh, uh, prepare ourselves and respond. Uh, so, uh, I think it is too late for us to think about prevent climate, climate change or prevent global warming. It is here. It is here. So, our objective, our uh, infrastructure people should think about how we adapt, how, what we can do to retrofit ourselves, to minimize the adverse impact. That doesn't mean we should not do things that can prevent or slow down global warming, but we should start thinking about or doing things. Uh, there's a lot of issues. Uh, if you have questions, we'll talk. So, Sustainability, as I said, economic vitality and quality of life. Bottom line is the quality of life and social justice. The framework is changing. The traditional framework, traditional assets are changing. The technology will have to become the infrastructure more intelligent to be comparable with the intelligent vehicles. New analytics, visualization techniques, we need to handle big data. And the TAM in the context of smart cities around the world, the smart city concept has caught the imagination of the politicians. Quantification of investment trade-offs, then also how to measure sustainability, efficiency, effectiveness, and funding mechanisms. You know, direct user charging is something politicians don't like, is the electronic road pricing. And that, with the technology, the way is going, connected vehicles and autonomous vehicles. So that helps to implement electronic road pricing. And how we can make the politicians convinced, uh, I don't know, but something is going to happen. And that has to happen, will happen sooner or later. Uh, climate change or infrastructure planning, the effect, better uh, uh, understanding, different kinds of methodologies we need to develop robust solution, incorporating risk and uncertainty, better ways of measuring, monitoring, enhancing infrastructure resilience to both natural and man-made threats. Techniques of infrastructure management that foster sustainability, you know, the better life, the, the quality of life, social justice, environment, economic.
economy, those kind of uh, softer issues. And efficacy of technology and social media in enhancing infrastructure operations and monitoring. And uh, there are many places uh, uh, things can be done using social media for even maintenance uh, areas or safety improvement. Ways to render transparent objective act of stewardship, I already mentioned. So I conclude that transportation asset management or infrastructure asset management is still evolving. Our issues, concepts, tools still relevant. Motivation is still there. The better resource equalization, better safety, better economy, better uh, more mobi efficient mobility, smart mobility. Our tools have to be changed and improved and integrated and uh, better ways of doing project selection, etc. And uh, so there are challenges, uh, there are oppor also opportunities. Data part, infrastructure financing, climate change, uh, well, I'm repeating myself, but technology and social media are here and we must expand or understand better and incorporate to develop advanced tools and uh, which I have already mentioned to you several times. I, I, I really cannot tell you offhand, but uh, World Bank is way ahead. They use some of the tools and techniques that, uh, that uh, it, as a matter of fact, many countries those who are like India, or China has dropped quite a bit of World Bank. Uh, uh, India and many countries, they are hesitant to use World Bank money because World Bank requires a lot of work. A lot of work means it costs more. Uh, for example, I, I did work in, the, in India, or oh, many places I did, but India, I very clearly remember that uh, uh, there are a lot of accidents, lots of road accidents. World Bank demanded that he'll have to pay attention before you do anything else. But the Indian authority did not want because they have become used to it. The, the uh, construction sites, etc. A lot of accidents, all, all lots of stories. Uh, I'll tell you if you are interested sometime. But if the World Bank should do, they should perhaps uh, force the uh, countries to do better trade offs. That World Bank does not do. I can confidently tell you, there are still model roads, transit, but there is no way they compare and do it. So that's one area the bank can spend time. Smart mobility, not the automobiles, but how I can increase the, the mobility of the people. You know, that uh, better transit, better pedestrian facilities, and uh, 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 that, and, and also people to understanding that better transportation means better economy, not just uh, in an abstract sense. You empower the poor people, empower uh, women. Uh, uh, these kind of things may sound like I'm saying abstract way, it's not. I'll give you a small example. In Bangladesh, we did work in rural areas, and there's a lot of artwork, you know, you have to dig with shovel. So they employ, bank employ women to do that. And then that way, you are providing economic, you know, opportunity for women, poor women, and that empowers them. And by doing that, they, that their children, the families are better off, and better education, better health. Empowering women can help the developing countries tremendously. And that how we can connect the transportation opportunity to that kind of opportunity. It all depends. There is no one block of developing country. There are different levels of uh, economic uh, development. 
Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.